You're a really nice psychopath. Uh, that, sounds, <laughs> that could be could be accurate. I don't know. Okay, Dexter. <laughs> Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by all of the people who are not wearing masks these days. Have you guys encountered lots of people out in your daily lives who are not wearing masks? Uh, I mean, I live in a pretty rural area, so I feel like it's okay, but I don't like when I see it at like the gas station. That's a little too close for comfort. I live in the heart of the city and I see a lot of people who don't wear masks. And there's actually a anti-mask Steve who rides around on a bicycle and will yell at you and use whichever slur he feels best fit your identity to tell you that you are a coward for wearing a mask. Well, that's horrible. So, That's pretty awful. Virtual hug. (laughs) Seriously. Well, uh, on that note, (laughs) I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health, and I am here with some guests this week because Chris Gill is away still. um, We'll be back sort of later in the summer. But as anybody who knows me knows, one of my favorite things in the entire world is getting to spend time with our amazing doctoral students. And so we have two of our amazing doctoral students here with us this week to talk about a study and and then a particularly interesting topic. So the first we have Niji Adrian from the Epidemiology Department and PhD student. Welcome, Niji. Thank you. And Julie Peterson, also from the Epi Department. Welcome, Julie. Hello. All right, so let's get into the show. So in our first segment, which is our journal club, we are going to look at a study on term complications and the risk of preterm birth. And then in our second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we'll talk about a paper that looked at whether or not we should use the results of non-significant clinical trials. And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we'll get into some things that make us laugh out loud or just kind of fascinated us. So let's get right into segment one. So we're going to talk about an article that looked at the impact of term complications and the risk of preterm birth. I am saying that as slowly as I possibly can because, boy, I had a hard time wrapping my head around this one. And Niji and Julie are going to have to explain this one to me. So it was published in the the BMJ and it was entitled Term Complications and Subsequent Risk of Preterm Birth registry based study. I don't I think I got that right. I don't think there was a registry based study. It just said registry based study. It was by first author Liv Kvalvik of the Department of Global Public Health and Primary Care at the University of Bergen in Norway. And let me give you some headlines on this one. So Eureka Alert says first pregnancy complications linked to increased risk of future premature birth. Yahoo News says complications during a woman's first pregnancy linked to increased risk of future premature births. And usnews.com says pregnancy complications raise future odds of preterm births, colon, study. Are those accurate? I'm, mm, I think they fairly accurately represent what the study said, but are they indeed what the study results should be interpreted to say? I'm not so sure. So, uh, Julie, can you start us off by telling us what this study did and what it is that they found? Sure thing. So, as you may be aware, preterm birth is a major cause of infant mortality and morbidity worldwide. Preterm birth is typically defined as birth at less than 37 weeks gestation, whereas a normal pregnancy is expected to last closer to 40 weeks. Preterm births that occur very early are usually considered to be the most severe because these babies have even less time to develop within the protected womb environment and will struggle to survive and thrive on their own. In this day and age, while we've identified risk factors and complications that increase the risk for preterm birth, we still don't fully understand exactly why preterm births happen, and unfortunately, we certainly don't have a good grasp on how to prevent them. 
Clinical care right now focuses mostly on monitoring pregnancies that are known to be at risk for preterm birth, intervening when necessary to prevent more adverse outcomes. Other than recommending behavioral and lifestyle changes, such as smoking cessation or achieving optimal weight, there really are relatively few clinical interventions available. These include progesterone pharmacotherapies and surgery to close the cervix, but these kind of services may not be available or effective for all women. One of the most major risk factors we've identified for preterm birth is having a prior pregnancy deliver preterm. Because history of preterm birth seems so important, it's theorized that at least some preterm births may be due to some biological condition, such as placental insufficiency, which may be consistent across pregnancies of the same woman. The placenta, in case you don't know, is an organ that transfers nourishment from the mother to the baby, and its functionality is critical to maintain normal fetal growth and development as pregnancy progresses. Several complications of pregnancy are thought to be related to placental insufficiency and also increase the risk for preterm birth. These include ischemic placental disease, which encompasses three conditions, preeclampsia, which is a severe form of pregnancy-induced hypertension, placental abruption, which is when the placenta detaches from the uterine wall before birth, and interuterine growth restriction, which is when a baby doesn't reach its full growth potential. It's theorized that these conditions share common underlying pathways leading to increased risk for preterm birth. However, the question remains whether the presence of these conditions in a term prior pregnancy may then increase the risk for preterm birth in subsequent pregnancies. So these are women who don't actually deliver preterm, but they do have the complications that often lead to preterm birth. And are those women then at increased risk for preterm birth in their next pregnancy? Understanding this question could be important for two reasons. One, having these conditions, but in a term pregnancy, could be flagged as a group at higher risk for preterm birth in later pregnancies for increased monitoring, etc. And two, it may help to provide additional support that all of these complications are at least partially due to the same underlying etiology. Okay, so this investigation used population-based data from the Medical Birth Registry of Norway to study this question. This registry includes all births, both live and stillborn, after 16 weeks gestation, so it doesn't include early spontaneous abortions or elective terminations, and it dates all the way back to 1967. The researchers assembled a cohort of women whose first and second pregnancies were included in the registry linked using maternal identification numbers, and the primary analysis focused on a subset of women where their second pregnancy occurred between 1999 and 2015. However, in secondary analyses, they even expanded it to look back to the earliest years, all the way back to 1967. The primary outcome they were interested in was preterm birth in the second pregnancy, which they defined as births between 20 and 36 weeks gestation, including both live and stillborn. Gestational age was used to define preterm birth based on the time between the date of the delivery and the date of last menstrual period, unless data were missing on last menstrual period or if gestational age estimate differed from the last menstrual period compared to clinical ultrasound estimate by more than 10 days, in which case the ultrasound estimate was used instead. In addition, if in vitro fertilization was used, the start of pregnancy was assigned based on the date of embryo transfer plus 14 days. The quote-unquote exposures were five complications in the first pregnancy ending at term, 37 weeks or greater. And these included one, preeclampsia, which from their definition also included HELP syndrome and eclampsia, which is even worse than preeclampsia as well as superimposed preeclampsia among women with chronic hypertension, two, placental abruption, three, poor fetal growth, which was defined as size given gestational age at birth below the 2.5 centile. So these are really, really small babies. And this was done in part to exclude babies that are constitutionally small, so they're proportionately shaped and developmentally normal, but just small, versus ones that we think are affected by interuterine growth restriction. And then the last two complications were stillbirths and neonatal deaths within the first 28 days of life. 
In the most recent years, these complications were indicated in the registry by a standard checkbox, but for earlier years, the conditions were indicated through pretext fields. And a small percentage were excluded due to missing data to define preterm birth or complications, so they didn't use any kind of imputation. The covariates they considered for the adjusted models were all from the first pregnancy and included maternal age, smoking, which was measured at the end of the pregnancy and categorized as any or none, education, which was less than 11 years versus 11 or more years, with 11 years being equivalent to a high school education, country of birth, Nordic or not, and pre-pregnancy body mass index, where they categorized it as underweight and normal weight combined, overweight, and obese. Smoking and BMI were only available for more recent years in the database, so models adjusting for those variables only included a subset of the original women for smoking that was 1999 to 2015 and for BMI 2006 to 2015. The primary analysis used log binomial regression models to estimate relative risks and 95% confidence intervals for the presence of these five complications among term first pregnancies in relation to preterm birth in the second pregnancy, where term but no complications in the first pregnancy was the reference group. Unadjusted analyses were presented as the primary results. Multivariable models were referred to as those including, quote unquote, known demographic or behavioral risk factors which might contribute to the primary associations under study. The authors specifically did not use the term confounders because they considered their analysis to be focused on prediction. In addition to presenting the results for the multivariable models, they also had a ton of other secondary analyses, and I'll try to quickly touch upon these. So the investigators evaluated co-occurrence of the complications using a counter variable. They evaluated the role of medical intervention by looking at spontaneous versus medically induced preterm labor and C-section with no labor, and by looking for bunching of preterm birds in the later weeks of gestation. They also expanded to earlier years and stratified the results by time, with second birth being in 1967 to 82, 1983 to 98, and 1999 to 2015. They stratified by whether the partner was the same or different between the two pregnancies to evaluate the role of paternal factors. They also adjusted for the length of the interpregnancy interval, which has been found to be related to increased risk for preterm birth. They repeated the analysis restricted to first term birds that were in a more ideal window, 39 to 41 weeks, excluding early term and post term deliveries. And they also excluded women who experienced the same complication in the second pregnancy as in the first pregnancy. Lastly, they did what they called a reversal analysis, where they looked at how preterm birth in the first pregnancy predicted complications in the second pregnancy among those who delivered term in the second pregnancy. Okay, so for the results. Among the 302,192 women with a second birth between 1999 and 2015, 5.9% were preterm in the first pregnancy. As expected, women with a history of preterm birth were at greater risk of recurrent preterm birth in the next pregnancy, with a relative risk of 5.5 and a 95% confidence interval of 5.3 to 5.7. Among the 284,225 with term first pregnancies, the risk of complications in the first pregnancy ranged from 0.1% for neonatal death to 4.2% for preeclampsia. Although lower than the recurrent risk of preterm birth, each of the five complications of term pregnancy was associated with increased risk of preterm birth in the subsequent pregnancy, with relative risks ranging from 2.0 for preeclampsia to 4.2 for stillbirth. Although precision varied given the varying rarity of these events, 95% confidence bounds for these estimates were all well above one. The authors also provided absolute risks for preterm birth in the second pregnancy by these groups, which were 3.1% for term prior pregnancies with none of the complications, 6.1% following term preeclampsia, 7.3% following term placental abruption, 13.1% following term stillbirth, 10% following term neonatal death, and 6.7% following term small for gestational age. Relative risks were highest for early preterm delivery, ranging from 20 to 30 weeks, and the counter-analysis did indicate some kind of suggestion of a dose-response effect with concurrent complications being associated with even higher risk. 
The associations persisted across the wide range of secondary analyses, but some items to note. When excluding women who had recurrent complication in the next pregnancy, the relative risk for preeclampsia did decrease from 2 to 1.4. Relative risks were higher, especially for stillbirth and neonatal death, for spontaneous compared to indicated preterm, and for the most recent years compared to the earlier years available in the registry. When restricting to term births between 39 and 41 weeks, the relative risks were slightly attenuated for all complications except neonatal death, but this complication was also very rare. And overall adjustment for covariates had very little impact on the results. Lastly, the reversal analysis demonstrated that women whose first pregnancy ended in preterm birth had a generally increased risk of term complications in their second pregnancy, with the strongest associations observed in early preterm birth, 20 to 33 weeks. Wow. So that is a complicated study. And that's why I said in the beginning, you're going to have to explain this one to me a little bit. But if I get the, the overall message, essentially, you've got a, a large study 280 plus thousand women in Norway who have had a first pregnancy in which they delivered at term. And for those women who experienced one of those five complications that you mentioned, so preeclampsia, placental abruption, stillbirth, neonatal death, and small for gestational age, if they experienced one of those, they were at increased risk of experiencing a complication in the second pregnancy. Is that more or less summarize? Yeah. Yeah, more or less. Okay. So that is sort of the the the, the study as they present it. Niji, what's your take on this study? Is this a is this a good study? I think it's a it's a good study in terms of there's a lot of analyses. They sort of considered several different scenarios. And I really like that they use the fetuses at risk approach, which I then ended up having to look into and we mm -hmm. can talk a little bit more about, but a conversation that we were having a little bit earlier is I didn't really get what the point of the study was, because if you have these complications in your first pregnancy, you're already going to be under increased observation in your second pregnancy. And so it was sort of, none of the results were surprising, but I just, I, it felt like one of those studies where we're doing it because we're talented epidemiologists and we can do it and we have access to data, but I just wasn't sure what exactly this was adding in terms of how this would change clinical practice or how this really amplifies the body of the literature. So this, you're, you're, I mean, it feels like you, you wrote my notes for me or you stole my notes. I don't know which one, because we, you and I are thinking the exact same on this one, which is I struggled to understand what exactly the question we were trying to answer here is. Now, I, I don't mean to imply that there might not be some some useful information in here, but just starting from first principles, what's the question that they are trying to answer? Julie, what was your sense on that? Yeah, no, I had the same kind of thoughts. I mean, I feel like verbally they were emphasizing the fact that they were trying to do a prediction study. And I have to say, I don't do like prediction modeling. So right. my understanding of what that means probably is different from someone who actually does it. But my more lay person epidemiologist understanding of prediction modeling is it's really more focused on the outcome, like not the actual, like the effect sizes of the individual parameters put in mm. in isolation. Like you think of maybe like, what's your probability of having preterm birth in your next pregnancy, given that you were 28 years old in the prior pregnancy, you like haven't graduated high school yet, you're a smoker and you had preeclampsia in the prior pregnancy. And so you're not really focused in like specifically on the effect of preeclampsia, but rather just what's your probability of having preterm birth now in your next pregnancy. But they do seem interested in understanding specifically the effect of these complications. And as I kind of also felt the same thing as Nedji, like, really, what's the importance of distinguishing between whether you have the complication during a preterm period or a, or a term period? Because ultimately, we already know that these things all increase the risk for preterm birth anyway. So as she said, these women are probably going to be more closely monitored. And 
taking a step back, I think it's important for us as epidemiologists right now to really be considering like, what are the types of questions we want to be asking? And I think especially given kind of the disparities that are being highlighted, at least in the United States right now, even women who are quote unquote flagged as being high risk, they're not necessarily even going to have access or be able to come in for the rigorous monitoring that others are. And so I think it kind of highlights if this is the kind of research we're doing, we're in a way continuing to perpetuate some of the health disparities that exist. We already know in the United States where preterm birth is much higher than it is in a country like Norway, which I don't think they actually have these disparities. So maybe there, this topic is more relevant than it would be if we try to generalize it to the U.S. But at least in the U.S., I think that preterm birth among like white non-Hispanic women is closer to like seven or so percent, where it's closer to 11 or 12 percent among black non-Hispanic women. And Again, we already kind of know that these associations exist, so I'm just not really sure in terms of applying it to at least a U.S. context that it's really all that helpful because I don't think adding this into the guidelines is really going to change too much to clinical practice. And again, it might even further cause disparities because the white women would maybe benefit. hate to say, I mean, I know I'm generalizing to a very large group and it's not all, even white as a heterogeneous group, but those women may be more likely to benefit from the increased monitoring where there may not be the same kind of access for some of the minority groups and other lower SES groups, unfortunately. Niji, do you, do you share those concerns? I do. And so this brings us to sort of one of the, probably the last paragraph or the second to last paragraph that they wrote in the article in their discussion section, where they talk about the fact that in Norway, the population is generally healthier, their rate of preterm delivery is lower, and that perhaps if this question were to be studied under different circumstances or in a different environment, then you would have to consider other social and geopolitical factors. So I think in terms of trying to figure out if you've had sort of, because these are really serious complications. Like if you have a stillbirth or you've experienced preeclampsia or neonatal death, which I have a bone to pick about the neonatal death thing, but we can come back to it. I wanted to actually hear about the neonatal death, but. Oh, sure. Um, so the neonatal death thing is that I, so I was wondering whether or not they had information on cause of neonatal death because lumping in all deaths of neonates up to 28 days and sort of attributing those to placental disorders, I didn't really quite buy specifically because about, I want to say, so it's about 20% of neonatal deaths are due to birth defects. And mm -hmm. so having information on whether or not these babies are born with birth defects, I think is really important. And if about a quarter of them are then due to sort of complications in pregnancy, so placental abruptions, uh, preeclampsia, et cetera. So, and they sort of see stronger effects when they look at neonatal deaths and stillbirths. And so I just had some questions in terms of how these neonatal deaths are being classified and why those are being lumped into these complications. Uh, fair enough. And I, I, I share that concern, although I didn't, I don't know the field as well as you all do. So I don't, I don't know that that immediately stood out to me as much, but I, I want to go back to the earlier point that both of you were, were talking about. And I shared the concern about, you know, did we, did we need this study exactly? Or, or what's the point? And, and, as, as you both know from spending time with me, my mind always goes to the the target trial approach. What's the what's the hypothetical randomized trial that you would do if you could that this study is trying to emulate? And I couldn't wrap my brain around what that would be in this study. And that's what made me made me sort of back up. And I, I agree with you, Julie, that that they do actually say that they're looking, they, they, their interest is in prediction. So they, they say our focus is on prediction in the same way that preterm delivery in the first pregnancy is an important predictor of later preterm birth. For this reason, we present unadjusted relative risks as the main finding. So they're making it very clear that they're interested in prediction, not causation. And I do also agree with you, Julie, that at later points, it seems to me they do actually flirt with language that would suggest they actually do think there's causation going on in here. But let's say let's say their interest actually is in prediction. Do we gain much, Niji, by trying to predict 
whether or not a woman is going to, given that she has experienced a complication in a term birth in the first pregnancy, whether or not she's going to experience complication in the second pregnancy. Is there is there value to that if we're not talking about causation? There could be some value to it in terms of how do you better provide clinical care or services? So I guess in sort of taking a step away from the epidemiologist perspective, I sort of tried mm-hmm. to think of it in sur- the human aspect, right? Where yeah. if it's, even though your previous pregnancy ended at 39 weeks, and if you've experienced any of these complications, if we can then sort of add support, whether it's working with your clinicians or other birthing attendants, knowing that perhaps if you have a preterm delivery, then the baby sort of needs additional support. So whether they have underdeveloped lungs, et cetera. So I can see it from that standpoint, right? Where it's sort of, if you've had a difficult, because quite frankly, if you've had preeclampsia or you had a still birth before you had a difficult pregnancy or Mm -hmm. you had a pregnancy that ended in a loss. And so trying to center that experience and thinking about how do you then support that person who's now trying to have another child? I can see that, but I just, if I take a step away from that, and and I guess maybe then the argument can be, is that what we really should care about? Like what's the human factor and how does that impact people? So in my mind, I think that's important, but in terms of a research question, I didn't think that I, I did not personally think I gained much from it, but that is my Mm -hmm. humble opinion. No, I'm, I'm with you on that humble opinion because my thinking, and, and and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but my thinking is, if the goal is really prediction, why are we then limiting it to specifically women who had a complication, but also a full-term pregnancy as the first pregnancy? It's a very specific population within which we want to make predictions, as opposed to wanting to make more general predictions. Right. Julie, I, just, I wanted to go back to you. Are there Were there other sources of, of concern, you know, anything in terms of the, the more general ways we think about bias and studies, confounding and selection bias and misclassification? Did any of those stand out to you as potential problems? Or is this sort of a, a in terms of the kind of the, the gen, I don't want to say generic biases, but the biases we typically go to, was this fairly fairly well done. And it's really just the the question that we're questioning. I mean, I think, to be honest, all of those three, I think were very likely present. I think that they didn't control for too much. And the effects really didn't change too much once they did control for those things, which made me a little suspicious. I think particularly the way they define smoking was kind of limited. And so I'm not really sure if they're fully capturing. I don't, I want, I don't want to use the word confounding because that's not what they were trying to get at here. But if right. we were thinking of it that way, then I don't think they fully captured confounding by smoking. No, no but that's a really interesting point you raised because if, if we're talking about prediction, then there is no confounding. I mean, it's really a descriptive study or a predictive study. There is no confounding in the traditional sense that we think of it. But at the same time, including something like smoking, you might you might still expect to change the crude estimate. And you're you're saying you don't see that, which is sort of a little strange. Yeah. Yeah. And I was a little surprised that they didn't include things like other maternal morbidities, like having diabetes or chronic hypertension or anemia, especially given that they probably did have access to those data in the registry. And those things would also kind of contribute to this. And just thinking in terms of even if it is like more of a prediction study, I kind of wish we had a little bit more information on the covariates than they provided, because those are really the things that we can act on more readily than like these, the complications are super hard to even treat once they're diagnosed. Like it's really just a more closely monitoring the pregnancy kind of thing and then making decisions in the moment to prevent things from getting worse, basically. So things like smoking or BMI, if they seemed really important, then like you could even do intrapartum counseling. Like it doesn't all need to be done during the pregnancy itself, but in between pregnancies, like there could be further counseling of these women to, you know, stop smoking and 
reduce their BMI. But again, those kind of things are already sort of known and they're really, they're really hard to do. Like yeah. it's really hard to get people to change those behaviors. All right. Niji, any, any last thoughts before I, I take the last word? Yes. I realize I never finished my thought when you brought up the disparities piece. And what I wanted to say is sort of, I wish they had spent a little bit more time fleshing out this last paragraph where they talk about the fact that in Norway, people are generally healthier and that in a more heterogeneous population with greater income and health disparities, that the shared pathways may be a little bit different. And I actually think that's an interesting piece of the study. And maybe Mm. that sort of is what this brings to the table is thinking about how do you then take this well done and well designed study, but apply it to a context where perhaps the question is a little bit more relevant. Yep. And I, I, I think that, that fleshing out the, the question a little better might lead us to, to a slightly more useful answer. I do think that the analysis is, is elegant and it was nicely executed. I just think a little bit more clarity on exactly what it is we're trying to get out of this would have been, would have been, you know, would have, would have, might have guided it in a slightly different direction. I just want to end with one, one last comment, which is that, you know, I always look at the limitations section, not because I trust that the authors are always going to tell me what the limitations are. I have to do that a bit myself, but I at least want to know what they are thinking of as limitations. And as far as I can tell, the only thing they really listed as a limitation was the limited generalizability that you were just referring to. And I, is that, I mean, that is a limitation in the sense that no study is going to be able to tell us about absolutely every population, but is it, you know, it's sort of, I don't think of that as a standard limitation. So I was a little disappointed by, by that, but anyway, let's, let's move on to our second segment. So in our second segment, we want to talk about an article that was published in JAMA And it was by first author Paul Young, and it was entitled, When Should Clinicians Act on Non-Statistically Significant Results from Clinical Trials? And I'll just say up front, none of us are clinicians. And so I'm going to focus this this study a little bit more towards those of us who are epidemiologists. But let me give you just a little bit of what they talked about in this in this piece it was it wasn't a study it was a it was a piece an opinion piece or an essay and they sort of talked about the fact that there is uniform guidelines for reporting of trials in which statistical significance plays such an important role in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine and and JAMA and and other general medical journals and they say that because of this statistical significance reliance that studies generally get grouped into positive or no difference, positive, not meaning that it was a good thing that happened, but positive meaning there was a statistically significant result. And that dichotomization, they say, of the primary outcome is pretty limited. And I, I would certainly agree that, that taking that limited dichotomy of statistically significant or not is problematic. But they give a specific example of the FLASH trial, the fluid loading in abdominal surgery, saline versus and here's where I, I just fall down. Hydroxy, hydroxyethyl starch. Does that even sound yeah. close to a thing? Hydroxyethyl starch, yeah. Thank you. And they evaluated protocolized fluid administration with hydroxyethyl starch in 826 patients at risk of post-operative kidney injury who are undergoing major abdominal surgery. And they believe that this is an example of a trial that may change practice even though they did not have a statistically significant finding. So the reason that they say this is the p-value for this difference was 0.33. So they found a benefit in the intervention for mortality, but it was not statistically significant. And they felt that the mortality and acute kidney injury rates were numerically higher among patients who received the intervention, even though statistically significant was not achieved. And so they say arguably... In the absence of substantial differences in overall healthcare costs between the two strategies, the statistical significance of the primary outcome may be of less importance when established treatments are compared, because even subtle changes in the probability that one intervention is more effective than the other could potentially inform clinical decision making. Now, as I say, we are not clinicians, so we're not going to be in the position of having to make decisions like this. But I, I do want to get your thoughts on whether you think that we have an over-reliance on statistical significance, particularly in large, high-profile clinical trials, 
that leads us to discard evidence that we might otherwise find useful. And if you do, how we might re-envision things so that we can get ourselves out of that situation. Now that I realize the way I've said it, it's a very leading <laughs> question. But <laughs> Niji, what, what's your what's your initial reaction to these guys? These I think they're men. The, it's a man who was writing this, but this gentleman was proposing that we wouldn't necessarily always want to look at statistical significance to decide what's important. My very hot take, very spicy take, is that we should actually be talking about when should clinicians act on statistically significant results. But I realize that that's maybe impractical. Because wait, 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 wait. Sorry, say again. So what? What would be the the, the twist being that we should be questioning whether results that actually do find significance are worth acting on? Yeah. So that's my hot take. Okay. Say more about that then. What, why do you think that? Well, I think, A, it's reflective of my training and also the fact that I'm not a clinician. So I yep. will be candid with that. But the other thing is that we've talked, we've talked about this and I have talked about this with other folks where this over-reliance on statistical significance where, you know, it's either, I had a professor who used to say, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You either are pregnant mm -hmm. or you're not. And so this dichotomy of living in this like yes, no world, a lot of times you'll see these results where the confidence interval, one of them will be 0.99. And so they'll talk about the benefit of something. And then the next one, the confidence interval includes 1.01. .01, and therefore that's not statistically significant and we dismiss it. So mm -hmm. being a non-clinician, I understand that it's easy for me to be critical of how people interpret results like that, particularly because I I'm not in the position where I have to decide between treatments, but I, being an idealist, I think, though I agreed with a lot of the things that they talked about in terms of what you should consider before you consider statistical significance, I hope that we have a little bit of a conversation around the writing about cost, like thinking about cost when you're thinking about whether or not you should act on non-statistical significant results, because I don't think that cost should ever be a consideration when thinking about treating people, but that is my idealistic view. Yeah, uh, fair enough. And I, I do think we should have the conversation in both directions, whether we should never act on non-significant results or we should always act on significant results. And certainly I would I mean, the decision to act or not act is based on many things that are, are outside the bounds of simply whether or not the science tells us that there is an effect or not. Julie, what are your what was your reaction to this this article and the idea that we would ever think about changing practice based on non significant results or Niji's point of whether we might actually be over relying on changing practice based on significant results? Well, I like Neji's hot take. I didn't know she was going to say that. I can't say I I haven't really thought about that too much. But in terms of the article itself, and I'll have to think about the other a little bit more. I think the article did a pretty good job laying out the kind of it depends thought mm -hmm. process that epidemiologists often have, like thinking about the other evidence that's available in addition to any limitations of the current randomized trial, because even trials are not perfect, mm -hmm. as well as thinking about harm versus benefit. And they did, yeah, they talked a lot about costs. And I have to be honest, I'm never really sure whose costs they're talking about. Like, are they mm -hmm. talking about for the provider, for the patient, for both? I think particularly for the patient, I worry that that's not considered. Again, mm -hmm. in, in like the U.S., patients are paying all different things for the same care. And so that's such a complicated question and totally not my area. But I feel like costs and access for in terms of the patient are really important to consider versus whatever the standard treatment currently is. And they brought up long-term implications, which I also really liked. And I kind of wonder, because I don't really work too much in the clinical trials realm, how often are long-term costs and implications really considered when making these decisions? Um, I like that they brought it up, but I just was not really sure how often, because I imagine that relies on a lot of assumptions about what we currently know, and the world is constantly evolving. 
and also would probably require a number of simulations to kind of evaluate how, if we change our assumptions slightly, how that may affect kind of long-term implications of a change. So yeah, I have some other thoughts specifically about trials themselves, but in terms of like the way the article kind of talked about it, those were, those were my thoughts. And tell us your, tell us your thoughts on trials more generally, because it sounds like there is specific issues that came up in this related to this particular paper and its view on the dichotomization, but that are not central to that thesis. Yeah, well, I think in terms of the way trials are designed and analyzed, there are some issues that I'm not sure that like your average clinician may be totally aware of. So by setting, usually the alpha is set lower than the beta and the alpha is usually set at 0.05 or lower and the beta, I think usually at like 0.2 or 0.1. And so that would mean we're essentially preferentially choosing type 2 errors, so accepting the null when there truly is an effect over type 1 errors, or rejecting the null when there truly is no effect, just did you, by did design. You, did you just say that from memory? I am looking at my notes, but I did remember it when I wrote down okay. my notes, but I didn't trust I, myself to say it by memory <laughs> on while the recording was going. <laughs> I have to look it up every single time. And, and you both may remember that in my teaching slides, whenever I ask students what, it, what, what each one is, I then have, you know, hit the, hit the button on PowerPoint and it comes up so I can just read it rather than having to embarrass myself and say I, I get confused. So, Well, good. I'll pat myself on the back then. <laughs> so, sorry, but I, I, so I interrupted you there, though. Oh, no. So there's that one piece, which my understanding is basically because of that, like we'd really have to repeat the same trial over and over and over again to get a better sense of whether what we observed was kind of that more like fluke finding or was really representative of what's actually going on. And that's just by design. And then in terms of the way trials are typically analyzed, we usually rely for our primary interpretation on intent to treat. So like we analyze people according to how they were randomized in the study, basically putting preference towards controlling for confounding that was done through the randomization process, as opposed to thinking of the effect that misclassification may have based on people that were non-compliant to the treatment that they were randomized to. And I think we usually assume that that kind of non-compliance would be non-differential with respect to the outcome and would lead to a general bias towards the null. But that bias towards the null, again, is going to move not only your point estimate, but it's also going to move your confidence bounds closer to the null to make your main finding less likely to be statistically significant. I think there are like larger ramifications, like if you're having that much, that much of an issue with compliance in your study, then you might say, well, in a real world context, you wouldn't want to implement it because it seems so hard for people to actually adhere to it. Because in a study, people are really rigorously monitoring and trying to get people to adhere to treatment. And that may be even worse in a real world setting where people are kind of left more on their own to try to follow the treatment regimen. But I think if there is a good sense of the mechanism that's resulting in the non-adherence, then maybe that could be overcome or there may be specific groups of people that would be able to adhere to the treatment better than others. And maybe that would be known at least partially through the trial data. So that's, that's my take on the clinical trial issues. Okay, so, so a lot to think about. I mean, I, it's one of the things that occurs to me when I read this article was that, you know, we are not often in the position of having to make decisions like this based on a, a single study. In fact, we, we typically avoid that. Now, the, obviously, the, the current uh, COVID case is a situation where we might, in fact, make decisions based on a single study because there is such a, a rush for needing information. But it, it always feels to me like, you know, saying that a piece of information is not particularly useful because it wasn't statistically significant is a mistake, but also relying on, you know, one small study that, that was underpowered is also a bit of a mistake. Niji, do you have any reactions to that or, or any other thoughts you want to add about this particular topic before we move on? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think 
that you, I mean, you know how earlier you said, I stole your notes. It looks like you stole my notes this time around. I did actually. <laughs> but yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I wrote down was, do we ever have, I know we talk about having equipoise in, in studies and so, but like, do we ever have true equipoise? And if you do have true equipoise and you're trying to rely on the statistical significance, just one study, I, I think does a hard job of convincing you that now we need to overhaul everything. And this is, mm. this is our miracle drug, or this is our miracle treatment. So, you know, I think you really hit the nail on the head in terms of a, not having sort of this dichotomy of yes, no, but also, it's, it's hard to imagine that one study is going to be the end all be all of how you do things. Okay. So now you've made me realize that we have to add on as a topic for another day, this, the question that you just asked, which is, do we ever actually have perfect equipoise? Cause as a student, I started to, to think about that. The answer is, is probably we, we struggle with that way more than we like to to let on, but I will leave that for another time and we will move on to our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing. And uh, I'm going to take the prerogative to go first this time. And the reason that I'm going to go first is because I have to admit the one that I, I found for this time was, was interesting to me, but it's not, it's, it might not be the best one that I ever had. And so I'm going to let you guys uh, finish strong. Mm -hmm. But I, I found this article that I, I thought was interesting. I cannot tell whether this was actually ever published. It's it's just published online. It was from 2018 by Isabel Cote and Emily Darling. And it was entitled Scientists on Twitter Preaching to the Choir or Singing from the Rooftops. Did you guys ever read about this? No. No. So it's all about Twitter followers, and they did an, an analysis. So they say there have been strong calls for scientists to share their discoveries with society. Some scientists have heeded these calls through social media platforms such as Twitter, which, you know, it seems to me that if we look 20 years from now, social media is going to be the main way in which we share research. But that is just my opinion. But so what they wanted to do was to ask whether Twitter allows scientists to promote their findings primarily to other scientists or whether it helps them reach a broader non-scientific audience. And I have wondered about this for a long time because it has always been my sense that until, at least for me, until the coronavirus outbreak started, most of the people that were listening to me and I was talking to on social media was actually other epidemiologists. And it's only in the era of, of coronavirus that I think that people who are not epidemiologists and not scientists in general seem to have any interest in what I have to say. Not all of them seem to be very happy with what I have to say, but they are at least interested in what I have to say. So they analyzed the Twitter followers of over 100 faculty members in ecology and evolutionary biology, and they found that their followers are on average predominantly, so 55%, other scientists, which I have to say doesn't doesn't really surprise me. In some ways, 55% kind of seems a little low if you were to sort of choose the average person. I don't really understand how they selected their sample, so this could be a fairly selected sample. But they said beyond a threshold of about a thousand followers the range of follower types became more diverse and included research and educational organizations, media, members of the public with no stated association with science and a small number of decision makers. Now, it seems to me that it's a little hard to actually determine who's following whom because Twitter profiles don't necessarily tell you all that you would need to know. But, you know, it does suggest to me that I, I don't put any magic stock in this number of a thousand, but I did think, you know, I've always sort of suspected that there is some, you know, not exact number, but there's some sort of general range of Twitter followers that you get to. And after that, things start to expand because your reach becomes larger and you may actually be able to do the thing that we're always trying to do, which is talk to not just ourselves, because I think we are very good at talking to ourselves, but we're not as good at talking to people outside of our circles. So I just, I found this one particularly interesting, even though I will have to admit, I don't buy into the fact that the number 1000 has any specific meaning. So that's me. Okay. I don't know. I feel like I can afford to buy 250 additional followers. Wait, wait, wait. How much do 250 cost? 
I, I, I don't know, but I, that feels like a reasonable amount that I can buy. So I'm going to stick with that a thousand number and then I will truly be influential. Okay. So you feel like you get to 1000 and from there it just takes off. I, I mean, I think so. I feel like, you know, once you have 1000, it's just, it's, it makes people interested enough to know that, oh, it's not just this person's mom and their three friends who are following them, you know? Okay. Okay. So over the weekend, my daughter told me that I think she said, once you get over a thousand followers, you become a micro influencer. Mm -hmm. Is that a thing? That is a thing. What does that mean? It's a, it means that you have a small you have a small reach, but it's large enough that you can now start having paid partnerships with smaller companies that might actually pay you to have an hashtag spons post. Whoa, whoa, I don't even know what that means. So she also told me there's something. So that's a micro influencer, but then she said there's a mini influencer. Mm -hmm. Is that a thing too? That is also a thing. I, what is I that? Mean, my understanding was mini influencers or so I thought micro was between one and 5,000 and then okay. a five to 10,000 you're a mini influencer. So, but the game has changed because you have sort of the Charlie D'Amico's of TikTok who have 56 million on TikTok. So I'm just not sure that mini and micro influencers are commanding the type of rates that they really want to, but there's room for a lot of people to be able to make sponsored content. You are really not utilizing the fact that you have over 10,000 Twitter followers, Matt Fox. Okay. okay. So I have to stop you there. I don't know who Charlie, Charlie who? D'Amico, I, I believe. Is I don't know who Charlie D'Amico is. And normally, normally... When there's something like this that happens, it's my kids saying to me, you know, they'll say some name or some term. And then what I just do is I just turn to my wife and say, yeah, you don't know what that means. <laughs> right. We do. And then I can't do that here. So who is Charlie D'Amico? She is the most popular TikToker or TikTok person. Yeah. TikToker. Oh, wow. I'm mm -hmm. going to I'm going to have to look into that because obviously, you know, my goal is to become the world's most popular TikToker. Mm hmm. All right. Well, Niji, let's go on to you then. What do you got? I have toilet humor. Well, it's not really toilet nice. humor, <laughs> but apparently I'm 12 years old, but I listen to NPR in the morning. It's actually my alarm clock. So, okay, but so NPR is not a strong start for toilet humor. <laughs> I see. I thought so, but I just, just, I mean, it's not toilet humor. It's just talking about toilets. Okay. So as I mentioned, I wake up every morning to NPR and this came up a little while ago, but it was all about how America is losing the toilet race to Japan mm. and Japanese toilets. You know, they have bidets, they squirt water to clean your private parts. They have dryers and heated seats. So apparently if you really want a nice bathroom experience, moving to Japan is what you need to do because we are just not doing it when it comes to bathroom technology. But then they, they sort of like go into this whole thing about why we can't have high tech toilets and talk about a company called. Wait, Toto. wait, we can't. We can't have high tech toilets. I mean, I don't know if it's that we can't, but maybe it's that we're not seeing the potential in having heated seats when you go to the bathroom. Oh, just, I see know, the potential. Like in the middle of winter, you wake up at 2 a.m. Yep. A heated seat, I think, would truly change your experience. You're speaking my mm -hmm. language. Uh, <laughs> People love the heated floors. I don't see why this would be that hard of a sell. I, you know, so I think I'm going to start a petition where we should change all of our toilets to Japanese toilets. But it seems that so far my main roadblock might be that economists have studied the question and think that it's a waste of money for the U.S. And to that, I say, you are wrong, economist. Having heated seats and bidets are very important for the future of America. All right. I have to say, you know, as long as as long as the toilet has a heated seat and Wi-Fi, I'm fine. That's all I need. Wi-Fi? Yeah. You got to have Wi-Fi, right? Sure. <laughs> all right, Julie, what do you got? 
Okay, so earlier during the stay-at-home time, most of my feed was basically completely covered with either COVID-19 updates or people talking about what they were cooking and baking and their strong eating preferences. Mine too, yep. And so it made me kind of interested, has there been, and I was really surprised by some people's preferences, like people's opinion on like, whether or not to put cheese on a sandwich and what kind of cheese. Which... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> People insisting that Twizzlers are food or okay. delicious. Hey, Twizzlers Wait a are delicious, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm not I doing am this. starting to think that this is... You're talking about me. I... I mean, I, you were definitely involved in a lot of these Twitter conversations. I'm not okay. sure. You, I, the one by, about mustard disturbed me the most, how you haven't had <laughs> come to like mustard yet in your life and needed advice on how to get introduced to it. Okay, Strange. do you want do you, do you want an update on that? Because okay, I'm yes. almost I'm almost all the way through a bottle of honey mustard and I feel like I could I could I could go on to a regular mustard at this point, but I feel no need to. I'm trying really hard, but I feel like this might be a huge failure. Okay, so so basically what you're saying is that you agree that Twizzlers are fantastic. It's right? the wrong Angie? opinion. What what do you mean? It's I'm just saying it's wrong, but carry on. I I, I appreciate like I've accepted the fact that I can think that you all are wonderful people, great epidemiologists, lovely colleagues, great sense of humor, but have just terrible taste when it comes to candy. Okay, and but we can at least agree that on a sandwich, Swiss cheese is the correct cheese to be oh, eating. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I like right. Swiss cheese. I don't think I, I also will take a sharp cheddar, but Swiss is is great too. That's and why. what for for our international listeners, what is Swiss? Does anyone remember? Emmental. Emmental. There you go. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so it made me kind of curious if. There has been research done, which I'm sure there has, about whether there are correlations between people's personality and then the types of foods that they like. And not surprisingly, there is. And so some of those things that I can recall were that in general, and maybe this, I don't know, is this correlation or causation? We can maybe agree or disagree on that. But if you like, sweet food you are by nature a sweeter and kinder person mm, okay mm. if you like more bitter foods like black coffee or certain types of vegetables then there is some evidence to suggest you may be kind of a psychopath and the <laughs> <laughs> the, the, huh. the the hypothesis around huh. this being that our instincts historically are to tell us that bitter foods are dangerous and potentially poisonous and so that we should avoid those types of foods when we eat them. So people that are actually drawn to those types of foods may have something kind of wrong with them. However, on a positive note, you could think of it that you're just kind of breaking away and you're more sophisticated than those mm. primal instincts. Mm, yeah. I, I, I choose to believe I'm more sophisticated. Okay. I was going to say, I feel attacked by this study because I drink <laughs> black coffee. <laughs> Seriously, black coffee is, there is nothing better. I, I agree, but my yeah. friends just tell me that I'm drinking hot bean water, which is, again, not inaccurate, but whatever, they're wrong. Oh yeah. my goodness, they couldn't, it's the nectar of the gods. I couldn't agree more, especially having traveled across parts of this country where they definitely don't make the coffee strong enough. You don't want to be mixing anything else into it. You want to suck all of the pure coffee down that you can. Okay, so wait, now what, what happens if I like both sweet and bitter? Then I'm a very You're kind... really nice psychopath. Uh, that, sounds, <laughs> that could be, could be accurate. I don't know. Okay, Dexter. <laughs> All right. Well, that is the end of our program. Thank you to both Julie and Niji for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is fun. So if you've got any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at, at PopHealthyX, 
Or you can tweet me at at Prof Matt Fox or Niji at at Niji A or Julie at at Julie M. O. Peterson. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast. And Nick Guler for sound, editing, and reminding us of which amazing and amusings we've already done. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you will download our next episode. <laughs>